Hello everyone, uh, welcome back again. So uh, now I'm actually uh, going to the, our uh, theme topic, the mineral rights and leasing. So like at the previous lecture, we already have learned about how we actually explore. And after doing the exploration, we need actually know the oil and gas uh, would be in here. So, or even like, I mean, we do the, um, we do the seismic survey after that if we want to drill so at that time we need to do about like the mineral lights and leasing like I mean how it actually works like uh, what are the, who actually owns what right we need to know that so the legal rights to explore drill and produce oil and gas must be obtained before commencing any types of activity okay in most of the countries, the rights are controlled by the governments. For instance, it could be provincial, it could be federal, it could be the central government, or it could be the, uh, if it's territory, it could be like the other different types of the government bodies. But uh, it would be the national government. Uh, give an example, like in Canada, we have uh, two types of government. It's a provincial government and the federal government. So we will know in here, like, I mean, what are the, uh, what are the, um, who actually uh, would be responsible for all the mineral, who hold the rights of the minerals, okay? So the rights are often divided up within a sector called lease or license. And there's a type of uh, an example in, in Newfoundland, we'll actually go that uh, later on to the slides. Now, remember a legal arrangement with the governing bodies will often include the payments and the royalties of the monies to the government based on the production, okay? And these arrangements could be extremely complex, but we'll try to make it more simple to show you, okay? For the offshore, the right includes offshore areas up to 200 miles or 320 kilometers remember that okay after that it would be the international water zone okay so a country's right to the offshore areas would be up to 200 miles the land holder has no right in the underground mineral in most countries and i said most countries not every countries so since the private landholders of the land owners uh, do own the lands upon which the equipment of the drilling, exploring or development is done with the legal arrangement it must be signed with them, okay? Uh, this could be done from the oil and gas lease or from the license or the royalty. It's mostly actually the US uh, way to do that. On the government lands or in Canada, the crown lands actually, the license would be the individual uh, landowner, you'd be redundant, we don't need that at all. So here actually shows how the uh, federal or uh, central government actually controls, okay? For instance, in Canada, the provincial government is green. Uh, just the provincial government is actually um, are the responsible for the oil and gas. However, in the territories, it's the federal government, okay? Uh, we don't have much information about Quebec, because we don't know, but, and, and uh, British Columbia, but if you actually see in states, what's happened, you, uh, the provinces actually are responsible for, in most cases, the provinces are actually the responsible for uh, I mean, the states actually are responsible for uh, the uh, oil and gas royalty, exactly like the Canadian provinces. And the uh, red countries are the oil producing states. Mostly in here, you'll find these are the oil producing countries, and mostly uh, the uh, central governments actually uh, take care of all the rights, okay? That means in, in Russia, for instance, or in Saudi Arabia, or in Australia, everywhere, like the central government, actually, uh, or, or like in India, central government, actually, cares of that. Here's some example, like, I mean, the North Sea uh, oil states, 
the central government has actually taken up that too. But in case of offshore, it might be different. Okay, there could be some different arrangement, except like I mean, 200 miles from one land that would be under the central government, but it could actually depends. Now, um, uh, some states have recognized the ability of oil and gas to cross the property of the bound undergrounds. Uh, other states, they don't, okay? So, there are lots of, like, I mean, complex uh, uh, terms on, based on that. So, um, we are, we'll just uh, skip, actually, this part. Actually. Now, um, the government often offer lease on the basis of the sealed bids. Okay, we'll, we'll see some example of the sealed bid, how it actually works. But often, it is even impossible to get lease on the national parts of the protected lands. Remember that, especially probably if you actually um, know some um, news like uh, in in Alaska, it's uh, we have a uh, vast oil and gas resources, but sometimes we cannot actually just get that because uh, lots of like uh, reserves actually are in the national parks and the protected land. So it's it became more and more complex. And another complexity we have in Canada also, um, there's some protected lands, so uh, it's really hard to get the rights, the mineral rights from there. So what happened in U.S. In U.S. the bid uh, the bid sealed, bids are often submitted by the consortium, but the regulation forbids the bids from companies which produce 1.6 million barrels per day. It's just to prevent the monopoly. Um, now, the environmental impact statement or EIS, it must be done prior commencing any types of explorations, okay? So remember that we need to do EIS, okay? You will see an example of that too. Now, let's come to Canada. In Canada, the provinces actually control the mineral rights almost exclusively, except for some territories. In case of territories, central government, like the federal government, actually uh, control the rights. Uh, some companies have ongoing mineral rights, for instance, potash in Saskatchewan or nickel in Ontario. Okay, um, so if you're interested, you can actually go to there, the reference. Uh, the rule of capture, it's an interesting rule, it is like the person who first tap as a reservoir is entitled to remove as much as they can. So this is more like, I mean, the laws in the United States they have, okay? And there are others like, I mean, offset drilling and things, but oil and gas rights often don't include other mineral for coal, so those they have like I mean for different types of uh, minerals they have different types of uh, rights. Okay, uh, the oil and gas uh, is definitely among the most heavily regulated industry. Uh, yeah, DOE, DOL, so all actually departments have been involved in there. And the ownership of the mineral is a very, very complex thing. Actually, it could be done by the individual states, federal, or even the Native American uh, territory. So, um, for the Freeholders Association, you can go and take more. This is the, for the U.S. terminology. Um, I will actually um, um, skip this because this is more like uh, U.S. Uh, types of like a um, um, idea like I mean how the royalty <clears throat> lesser and, and lessy works but we are most interested in actually a good case study which is uh, I mean CNL OPB actually have a call of uh, call for bids in Newfoundland the uh, exploration license okay if we actually go to there if you click this link then you will find there are Two bids uh, happened in April 2019. Okay, and this is this bid is for a uh, call for bid in the southeastern Newfoundland and 
Jean d'Arc region. Okay, and this bid is for the exploration license. Now let's see. Let's see this first bid. Actually, what it says. The first bid it says the exploration license in southeastern Newfoundland region. Okay, so this is the call for bids. Let's go there. So this call for bids is a. Uh, you will find like a big like a chart like I mean what are the bits and stuff but let's uh, read like I mean let's uh, go and let's read so what's happened the on November 6 2019 uh, they have sub, uh, they had the deadline to submit the bids okay and this bid is for the the uh, offshore Newfoundland, okay. And you remember, like uh, I said, like we have to do the EIS at first. So here it also see like environmental impact assessment. Uh, at first, we need to do the uh, uh, impact assessment, and after that, when the assessment is done, then we will have the and also you remember like uh, for any, the uh, territories for any lands entirely or partially beyond Canada's 200 nautical mile zone additional terms and conditions might apply because that would be the international water zone okay so uh, what I would suggest I would suggest you to go to this speed okay please go to that and then you can actually have better understanding like i mean how this uh, call of for bid actually works see the regional maps okay how this regional maps actually see and how this uh, uh call for bids uh, the things okay so it would be a good case study for you okay so you don't have to go to the whole report what i would suggest like to just to uh see the not not for the whole report just to see the yeah the regions okay and also the terms and conditions in here okay so there that does you would have more understanding like i mean how this uh bid actually really works okay so uh, this would be it and and as I said please go to the other reference we already have um, and then we can actually have more, more understanding and at the Q&A session we'll have more uh, we'll have more um, information of that all right so take care everyone and have a good day to you goodbye